Hello, friends and comrades, ladies and gentlemen. I read what I wrote. On September 12, 2024, the conflict among the Russian Democrats in exile intensified suddenly. That day, September 12th, leader of Alexei Navalny's anti-corruption foundation in Russian FBK, Fond Borby with Corruption, Maria Pevchik, published parts of her telephone conversation with the overt agent of Russian intelligence, FSB, that is Federal Security Service, with its agent, whose name is Andrei Matus. Maria Pevchik phoned him after he phoned another leader of the Anti-Corruption Foundation, Leonid Volkov, telling him that he, Volkov, had been severely beaten here in Vilnius on March 12, 2020. 24, on the order of another emigrant, wealthy Leonid Nevzlin, in Israel, and that Maria Pevchik needs to be wary of Nevzlin. Andrei Matos offered to sell huge amount of Nevzlin's phone chats and negotiations for a large sum of money. So Maria Pevchik decided to phone Matos herself. I think we, as citizens of Lithuania, are interested primarily in the Lithuanian component of this case. After all, both the arson on July 7, 2024, of the model of the punishment cell where Alexei Navalny was often locked up, and the beating of Leonid Volkov on March 12, 2024, took place here in Vilnius. On July 7, 2023, more than one year ago, Someone tried to set on fire Navalny's box, just mentioned by me, as I call it. The incendiaries were not found so far, as I know. In the description of this my video, I provide a link to my video of these days, named Slow Search, showing Lithuanian undercover agents waiting for me and meeting me along my entire walk to that spot on Salivaldide Square, that is, City Council or Municipality Square, and then back. That is, I show, a system of illegal total surveillance. So, how was it possible to not detect the incendiaries, all the more that all streets and squares in any city are watched by plenty of CCTV cameras? I suppose at the end of my video that perpetrators might be the Ukrainian or Lithuanian nationalists associated with the Lithuanian secret services. In her investigation, Maria Pevchik says that Andrei Matos confessed to her that it was just he who had organized that arson. How he ordered the attack on our installation of Navalny's cell, sewage was poured on it and an attempt was made to set it on fire. My note. So the customer was Matus, but who the executors were? Now Leonid Volkov. He had been beaten on March 12, 2024. Look, my video attackers not seen. I suppose there that the beating could be possible also with the knowledge of the Lithuanian secret services. It turned out later that Lithuanian police, having analyzed the CCTV records, figured out that the attackers were Poles who came from Poland. Lithuanian informed the Polish police, which detained them. So maybe the Lithuanian police really didn't know at the moment when the executors from Poland had entered Lithuania. But even if so, can one believe that the police and counterintelligence are not monitoring Leonid Volkov himself and his colleagues and their places of residence? Known Russian opposition scientist Professor Dmitry Oreshkin was forced to emigrate to Latvia. He told once that he occasionally sees some people watching him. However, he added disappointedly, I understand that this is necessary. It goes without saying that he had in mind not Russian, but rather friendly Latvian secret services. Is in Lithuania otherwise? Speaking to Volkov in July 2024, Andrei Matus warned him that he, Volkov and Maria Pevchik are watched by Nevzlin's agents. 
you had been to be beaten still more severely with the hammers up to a wheelchair condition and much earlier than it occurred in fact. The executors could not reach you quickly. You and Pevchuk are watched constantly. You will see all photo reports. All your houses, cars, persons you meet in restaurants. Photo reports were sent to him, that is to Nezlin, online. I want to recommend you to not only to speak with Maria, but suggest she to change her residence. We have photos from inside her house. Yeah, not too nice. He, that is Nevzian, had an obsession to take photo of each of you, sleeping. What? Kidnapping? Transportation to Russia? Wheelchair? Spy camera in a sleeping room? Just need to correct Maria Pevchi. Matos spoke about photos only. To make photos, it is available for private persons to take pictures or videos surreptitiously, indeed. Maria has to recall all those her visitors and guests who have ever visited her. Lithuanian Secret Services terrorized me for 19 years, non-stop. Also, Irma Shmukštytė in Druskininkai and certainly many others and staying in aware of who and why are tracking prominent Russian oppositionists here in Lithuania. This is absolutely incredible. Maria Pevchik also said that photos showed by Matos contain not her house and a woman by a car is not she because she has not car. She admitted that the photographers deceived Nevzlin this way. It is really difficult to guess, but we see nevertheless that they knew Volkov's house, his car and his movements pretty well. So it turns out that the older Russian agent Andrei Matos Fulfilling Nevzlin's orders, allegedly, organized arson of the Lionel's box and was even allowed to learn that Anatoly Blinov organized beating of Leonid Volkov and then transportation him to Russia, turning him disabled. Unexpectedly, Matos told Maria Pevchik something else. Once again, he is an extremely shady character whose occupation is to bribe and to corrupt officials. It's all the more surprising that he told me that it is as long as for three years he is working for Mikhail Khodorkovsky. Oh my God, would you exclaim, how is it possible? How could he get in the Khodorkovsky's opposition liberal organization? which declares values of democracy, law, justice. What kind of services might Khodorkovsky need from Matos? By asking this question, we find a person named Chris. Matos told us everything in details. During three years, I have been fulfilling various messages and was kind of confident assistant of both Mr. Nevzlin and Mr. Khodorkovsky. It started in 2019. And after that thing with the hammers happened, I was told that a leak occurred. The executors held phones and began to blackmail. The problem needs to be solved. I solved it, took the phones off them. I have all phones. And then Mr. Nevzlin decided to kill me. Briefly, it worked as follows, according to Matos. Khotorkovsky has a head of his security service, some Lithuanian whose name is Chris. He also heads Khotorkovsky's investigative media outlet, Dossier Center. This center collects plenty of proofs of corruption and war crimes committed by the top Russian officials. It covers very large range of events. I believe only a large staff can do such work, apparently also having intelligence data. Nevzlin has similar confident security man, former Israeli security officer Roman Zelasko. Somehow this combination is working. Some things Matos does for Khodorkovsky and Chris provides materials for the dossier center, as he says, and some things for Roman Zelasko and Nevzlin. Innocent things initially. For example, to learn what is going with Alexei Pichugin, sentenced to life imprisonment. He is their former colleague. Then less innocent, for example, to bail out of prison Nevzlin's relative. 
or on the contrary, to jail someone who testified against Nerzin. I repeat, this is how Matos himself describes his job. Of course, we checked everything we could. Chris, I freeze the frame of Maria. Is Christianos Kuczynskas, and yes, he wears for Khodorkovsky. Roman Zelasko really exists, and so on. Giving an interview to journalist Alexander Plushchev, Mikhail Khodorkovsky corrected Leonid Volkov and Maria Pevchik. Leonid Volkov and Maria Pevchik hinted several times that Matus' words, as though he was my assistant for three years, are true. But it is not true. I did not see Matus, did not exchange with him, did not meet him. Dossier Center did not pay him salary. Each time Khodorkovsky mentions Dossier Center, he has in mind Kristijonas Kuczynskas. Matos is wealthy enough. It was only a couple of times when he received money from Dossier Center, when the center asked him for some things, for specific materials, he said that he had to pay, but those were little money. For the dossier center, he was a source of information, not bad at first, since he was in conflict with the FSB and was very eager to tell everyone how influential and unhappy he was. Well, that is, he spoke so about the conflict with FSB. He really had been. At some moment he was forced to leave, it seems, for Turkey. It was just that moment he made contact with the dossier center. As you know, he swindled within the judicial system, whereas judicial system is managed by the FSB. I, Radovich, testify categorically that in Lithuania it goes the same way. The judges willingly fulfill suggestions of the police and counterintelligence if they receive them. That's where that conflict arose. But then he restored the relationship, and when we understood that he is communicating from Moscow, that is, he restored the relationship. Then the dossier center decided naturally that the operative games, it's not something we feel confident about, and stopped interacting. However, it is not Andrei Matos' relationship with Mikhail Khodorkovsky personally that matters but rather his relationship with the collaborator of the Lithuanian State Security Department, Chris, or Kristijonas Kuczynskas. Here is what Matus told the lawyer of the Navalny Anti-Corruption Foundation, Ivan Zdanov. Ivan Zdanov says, At the very beginning of the following continuation of this recording, Matos mentions certain Dima. Apparently, Chris introduced Matos to him. <laughs> Lawyer Anatoly Blinov on the left is meant. and so on. That is, if I am not mistaken, it was Chris who introduced Matos to Sam Dima and Blinov. Investigative journalist Roman Dobrohotov discussed the issue of interest to the Anti-Corruption Foundation, namely whether Khodorkovsky was involved in those attacks. Dobrohotov believes that he wasn't, since, although it's true that Nevzlin said that Khodorkovsky confirmed the Vilnius address of the foundation, likely if Nevzlin named the address, and asked if it was the exact address of the foundation, Khodorkovsky, somehow knowing this address, could have confirmed, yes, this is likely that same place, not being aware of what for Nevzlin needed it. But I am interested in something completely different. How could Khodorkovsky know classified addresses in Vilnius? Only one way, from the officer of the Lithuanian State Security Department, Chris, Kristijonas Kuczynskas.
So, on the one hand, this person is a liaison between Khodorkovsky and Lithuanian State Security Department, whereas on the other, the department bosses likely permitted him to try to take advantage of the opportunity to collaborate with Russian intelligence. Concerning the first point, in general, friendship between Mikhail Khodorkovsky and Lithuania began most likely in 2002. Before that year, the majority of shares of Lithuanian oil concern Majeku Nafta, that is Majeku City Oil, belonged to the American oil concern Williams. The rest belonged to Lithuanian government. In 2002, the government permitted Williams to sell its shares to Russian oil giant Yukos, created and headed by Mikhail Khodorkovsky. Khodorkovsky took over as much as 86% of the Majeku Nafta shares. I am sure it was right then that close collaboration between Mikhail Khodorkovsky and Lithuanian Secret Services began. Next year of 2003, Mikhail Khodorkovsky was imprisoned in Russia by Russian government and his best friend Leonid Nevzlin began to manage Yukos and Majeku Nafta. In 2006, Russian government drove Yukos into bankruptcy and its Majeku Nafta shares were acquired by Polish oil concern Orlean. In 2002, Lithuanian operative Kristijanos Kuczynskas was likely too young yet, but several last years he likely serves as a link between Khodorkovsky and Lithuanian State Security Department. As for the Russian secret services, the Lithuanian ones have always secretly collaborated with them. Russia used to return criminals who escaped to it. In the year 2006, Lithuanian millionaire of Russian origin, Viktor Uspastik, was detained in Moscow by the Lithuanian request for a short time, it's true. In December 2007, Lithuanian State Security Department warned Consulate of Russian Federation in Vilnius that I personally was walking to the reception room of Consulate, so the agent was already waiting for me there in silence. So it was not too surprising when later, in January 2008, in Moscow, Russian agents have been waiting for me literally everywhere, wherever I was heading. Service for service, this is an unofficial relationship. So this is quite normal if Kristijanos Kuczynskas maintained business-like relations with Russian spy Andrei Matus. I think that the Lithuanian government is now embarrassed. On August 5th, 2024, Leonid Nevzlin delivered a complaint to the head of the Bureau of Lithuanian Criminal Police, Arunas Maskolunas. And on September 16th, like the similar document to Prosecutor General of Lithuania, Nida Grunskenia, Nevzlin claims that he has nothing in common with all these crimes and allegedly his phone calls and his voice were fabricated by Russian secret services and that he is slandered by Andrei Matus and Anatoly Blinov. On September 13, next day after the Maria Pevchik investigation was published, Anatoly Blinov was detained in Poland. They certainly knew him before. Depending on Blinov's testimony, Lithuanian authorities will discuss whose side to take, whether Nevzlins and Podorkovskis or anti-corruption foundation. These officials are now trying to outline probable tactics and judicial decisions in this case. Director of the State Security Department of the Republic of Lithuania, Prosecutor General Nida Grunskene, Minister of the Interior Agne Bilotaite, General Commissioner of the Police Renata Spozela, Head of the Bureau of Lithuanian Criminal Police Arunas Maskolunas. They may involve President if necessary. I would like to be wrong, but I admit that the scales may tip not for your benefit, boys and girls. Simply compare your background with the background of those the two. 
Russian government killed Alexei Navalny not for the anti-corruption of revelations. These revelations have almost no political significance, but because he managed to revive and to reanimate a massive protest after 2012. Now Alexei Navalny is gone, the movement is dispersed, you have lost your political base in Russia, and also you do not possess a lot of money, more unpleasant surprises may occur. If so, make up your mind to abandon sectarian political tactics. Seek compromise with older people in exile. Experience in government, politics and matters of secret services. Thank you for watching.